if you recall last week, we uh, spoke about the whole concept of the period of from Rabbi Kiva and the period of the ten martyrs. And what we saw very clearly was that many of the Medrashim or Talmudic references to Rabbi Kiva at his time can be understood much more carefully if we realize who Rabbi Kiva was and what the nature of his period, his period of time represented. And as we said last time, Rabbi Kiva represented a time which was very sensitive to the coming of the Mashiach, the Mashiach to the final redemption. And that the difficulties which ensued Rabbi Kiva, with Bar Kakhba, with his students, and so on, is all reflective of this concept that he represented a possible messianic redemption. Now obviously it failed for the reasons that we spoke last time and we have to go through this history and the next really most obvious time when again you had the possibility of Mashiach coming was much further later on. Now I want to be very careful, clear about this. I'm going to be speaking about the 17th century, 16th and 17th century. That's a long time after Rabbi Kiva. It's about 1500 years later. Now, it is my belief, basically, that the 16th and 17th century was another period of time which was highly sensitive, so it was another critical period which was highly sensitive to the coming of the Mashiach. And we're going to discuss that tonight. But that doesn't mean that in the 1500 years since Rabbi Kiva, until this time, the Mashiach could not have come. As we said, every generation has the potential to, uh, for the Mashiach to come. Nor does it even mean that there weren't critical periods between them, you see. Uh, to identify those critical periods is not easy. It takes a lot of detective work to really identify what those periods are. And uh, I'm not going to do that. My purpose is not to go and to examine every generation of history, even if I would know how to do it. And I don't have that level of information to examine every generation to see what its messianic potential will be. That would be an enormous amount of difficulty to do that. You'd have to know things that are very, very deep things. Uh, it's possible, but uh, you'd have to know a, a very, very profound, profound things. At this point, we can only see the tips of the iceberg and not underneath the water itself. So we can see the main piece of history when the possibility of Mashiach could have come. And we already basically have spoken about about five of these periods, I think. So far, we spoke about Adam Rishon, Martin Torah, Yerobim ben Avot, the period of Abikiva, and now up to the fifth important uh, period, which is the time uh, of the 16th to 17th century. Uh, but again, that doesn't mean that the one period in between that Mashiach can come, obviously could have. But these are major things, and it's from these five different periods of history that we can begin to understand what does it mean that a Mashiach is about to arrive? What does that look like in the face of history, you see? What is going on in each generation which is sensitive, highly sensitive to the possibility of a Mashiach coming, do we see? So these five different uh, times served us as a very good model to analyze what history looks like whenever the Mashiach uh, it seems to be very, very close in approaching. Now, the fifth and final period which we're going to analyze before we begin to go into more depth on the individual idiosyncrasy of the Mashiach himself and what we're going to begin to go into the light of the Mashiach, the awe of the Mashiach, the concept of the Torah, the Torah of Mashiach, and then the personality of the Mashiach, and then the entire process of Mashiach and how the Guru will take place uh, up to and including right into Olam Haba. We have some very interesting stuff in front of us. Very deep material in front of us about what's going to happen. But uh, let us review now <clears throat> this last important phase. And we can learn a lot of very, very deep things. It's because this last important phase of history, which represented a possible coming of the Mashiach, a more critical coming, tells us to a large degree why modern history looks like the way it does. You see, you remember last week we laid down a very important thing when we talked about the ten martyrs? We said, why do ten of them have to die? And remember what we said? We laid down a very important principle that when the Mashiach is about to arrive and he doesn't arrive, <laughs> that means that there's a new build-up of an enormous accusation against Kalisol. The Bunisham then has to, so to speak, have a buy time, if I may use the expression, 
or rather delay the accusation so that the Jews can go on with their history. And what we saw was that with the death of Rabbi Kiva and the ten martyrs, the Bonachon paid the bill to the accuser, or the Makati, or the Sutton, so that the Sutton would be satisfied with simply the mere prevail that the Jews would have from then on, which is the Golas, or the exile, and not attempt to annihilate them, you see. The Bonachon exchanged annihilation for exile, so that the Jews would at least survive and not be annihilated, even though the Midas Hadin, or the attribute of justice, always demands annihilation. Now, in order to pay that price, the Bonnet sacrificed ten martyrs, who of course represented the ten brothers of Joseph, the nine brothers and the Shina, and the Bonnet sacrificed them to the Romans, and in so doing, allowed Kalisho to survive. And as we said before, we've laid down long before last time, but you see this clearly from that time, that every time the Jews are about to bring down an enormous Kedusha, and they are un- un- unable to bring down such Kedusha, that Kedusha then is, goes into the hands of the Sutton himself, of the accusing angel, and that gives him enormous power to come down and to begin to punish the Jews in different ways, but not to destroy them, you see. That Kedusha in his hands does not give him the ability to destroy Kedusha, simply to punish them. And the death of the ten martyrs gave him the ability to punish Kalisol, but it robbed them of the ability to destroy Kalisol or to annihilate Kalisol. And that's a very important thing. Now, there was another very important thing that we should have mentioned last time, which is very, uh, another thing, is that at the time of Abikiba also, with the death of Abikiba, certain things were happening in the world at that time as well. And what we have to look at, you see, is in the time of Rabbi Kiva, is the failure of Rabbi Kiva in the generation to bring the Shia. That failure resulted in the next 1500 to 2000 years of God. But it also resulted in some other very, very important phenomena, very critical phenomena. And what that was, was that the Kedusha, as we said, was transferred to the Sutton. Now when Kedusha of the Jews, especially the Messianic Kedusha, it transferred to the Sutton, what that means, first of all, is that the Sutton now is able to come down and really punish the Jews. But he's able to do something else, because when he absorbs that Kedusha, that Kedusha now can be used as a new force of seduction in the world to attempt to take the Jews further away from the Torah. Now this is a very, very subtle thing, and the truth is, if you really understand the subtlety, you will have acquired an enormous weapon against the Sayyid Yetzirah. What is this thing? What is this understanding? We have once mentioned before that Kedusha has certain basic properties. Kedusha, which is spiritual power, has certain basic properties. It has a property called Oz and a property called Teferis. I don't know if you recall. Kedusha represents the power of existence or the power of life. It represents the power of reality. Tuma does not represent that. Tuma doesn't exist in and of itself. Because Tuma, in essence, or evil, in essence, is simply the absence of good. It's really chasson. Chasson really is the absence of perfection, or shlemus. And when something exists in an imperfect state, there is a feature of it which appears to be evil. But what it really means is incomplete or it's inadequate. In order for Sheker, for evil to exist, it must use Kedusha. Because Kedusha is the only thing which has life or reality. Kedusha emanates from the Bonisham as such. It's the power which emanates from the Bonisham, the Kedusha or the light of the Shrina, and that's what creates reality. Reality only comes from Kedusha. So even evil must use Kedusha, or else it cannot survive. What does the Kedusha give somebody who has it? It gives them two things. One, it gives them O's. O's means strength or power. And what essentially that is, is the power to do things in reality. It's the power of existence itself. It's the power of reality. The power to do something or to get things done. Therefore, all success is based on the acquisition of Kedusha. For you to be successful in anything you want to do, you must have Kedusha. Because Kedusha is the generative power which allows success to be. Why? Because Kedusha is the force of existence, the reality. Even the Sutton, as we said, 
needs Kedusha for him to do what he has to do. Kedusha has another important property called Tferis. Tferis means beauty. And what Kedusha does, it not only is a force of existence, but when Kedusha is present, it also demonstrates the beauty of existence. And the beauty of existence is nothing more than the Yichud of the Buddha Shalom. Since God created reality, all reality reflects the fact that there is one author or one creator behind it. That means that all of reality, in terms of its laws, and just the way it is, exhibits an absolute harmony and an absolute balance and unity in its essential structure. Existence, or the structure of existence, reflects the notion that it all comes from one being, who is the Buddha Shalom. That's why if you study any, if you study any aspect of reality in all of its chokhmas, physics, or all of any of the sciences, in biology, chemistry, and so on, or even in art, or in any of these things, you would see behind all these things a tremendous unity or a pattern of arrangement. That pattern shows us that somehow every aspect of reality is connected. Therefore, Kedusha, or existence, reflects itself to the mind or the perceiver as something having complete, total unity. So Kedusha reflects both these things. Oz, or power, the power of existence, the power of reality or success, and the third, which is very deep understanding or the ability to see the systematic arrangement and the harmony behind all life. In its highest form, in its highest form, the Kedusha, in your, what Kedusha would give you, is the power to live eternally. There's no greater power than that. The power of eternity itself. Because the power of eternity is existence. If you would ever grasp the reality of existence itself, you would live forever. That power lies in Kedusha. And of course, as we said, that's the reason why you do the mitzvah, to bring the Kedusha into your neshama, so that you can transform reality into a permanent existence. But that power comes from the Kedusha of the mitzvah. In addition, you would also get what's called the ability to recognize beauty or the first or the unity of the Vanisham. And that comes through Chachma or through wisdom. A person who possesses the highest form of Kedusha would be able to understand all the laws of reality and why those laws are the way they are. He would understand why everything has happened from the beginning of time to the end of time and why everything was designed in the way that it was designed. We're talking about perfect wisdom or perfect knowledge perfect understanding that also comes from Kedusha it's a light which once is in you gives the ability of perfect understanding because perfect understanding is nothing more than the ability to discern perfect unity in reality itself so these are the two features of Kedusha now when that Kedusha is lost by Kali Yisrael, especially when that Kedusha is very high, which what? Which is, it is when it is associated with the possible coming of the Mashiach. Let's remember, a generation which is very, very close to the coming of the Mashiach has access to very, very high levels of Kedusha. That means that when that Kedusha does come down, they have the power to do enormous things and to understand enormous things. But if the Jews lose that power, then that power goes over into the hands of the Sultan. That means that it is the Sutton who has the power now to control reality and dominate our reality. That's why the Sutton can come down and suddenly create a very great evil in the world and the Jews are persecuted. Because that Kedusha, which he now possesses, which once belonged to the Jews, he puts into the hands of his representatives. And the representative of the Sutton, in our times and in all times, is essentially Esau and the Goyim, especially Esau. All the nations that have come from Esau are essentially the vessels which hold the Kedusha of the Jews. And that's the unique relationship that Esau and his, all the, gen- the nations that come from him have with the Jews. That if the Jews forfeit their Kedusha, it goes into the hands of Esau. And then Esau takes the Kedusha which once belonged to the Jews and is able to persecute them with this power that he has. Now he does that for a reason. Because when he does persecute the Jews, that Kedusha then is restored to the Jews. That's the entire ultimate objective. But the fact is that when the Jews sin, the Kedusha that they lose go into Esau, and Esau, with all the nations of the world that they represent, begins to capture that power. 
Now, when the Jews go through a period when they experience great destruction and loss, they experience great loss of Kedush as well. For example, one of the main periods where the Jews lost an enormous amount of Kedusha is when the first place of Middash was destroyed. But when the first place of Middash was destroyed, which is in far, about 580, 586, that Kedusha went into the hands of the Sultan and went therefore to who? To the Babylonians. And the Babylonians were able to come down to the Jews and destroy the Beit HaMikdash. But the Babylonians destroyed the Beit HaMikdash with the Kedusha of the Jews. It wasn't some foreign power. Babylon, you see, had usurped the power of Karasol through the Chatoyim and used it against them. So they destroyed the Beit HaMikdash. So Babylonia took the Koya or the power which was invested in the Kedusha of Karasol. But what about the Tzeres? The beauty of that power, you see, the ability to understand wisdom in very high degrees. Where did that go? Well, that went to a different nation. And if you look around in history at the same point in time and you'll ask, where do we see some kind of enormous upsurge in history among the Goyim, in the Chachm of the Goyim? You, all you have to do is simply look to a place not far from Israel, in Asia Minor, which is now Kandai, Turkey, in a place called Miletus. And you will find that Miletus was a Greek city-state that was one of the main city-states of Greece and it was in the town of Miletus which first formulated the Greek alphabet and Greek science so that the individuals or the school of philosophy which first started Miletus was the first school of philosophy as we know it that really started in all of Greece and Rome and which influenced all of Western civilization for the next 2500 years all of Western civilization as we know it today is based on intellect, the ability to understand reality, science, philosophy. But where did all that start with? All that started with ancient Greece. And it was ancient Greece who first produced the greatest philosophers. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Pythagoras, and the greatest mathematicians, Archimedes, and so on and so forth. The greatest Chachamim or wise people or philosophers came from Greece. To such an extent that even the Gemara says, the Talmud says, that if they tell you there is Torah among the Goyim, do not believe them. But if they tell you there is Chochmah or wisdom among the Goyim, believe them. And what they were speaking about was Yovan, Greece. Greece is the father of philosophy, or the nation which is the founder of philosophy, or the ability to look at reality in intellectual terms and understand the unity which exists in reality itself, whether through philosophy or through science or whatever have you. It's from Greece. And Miletus was the first city state that began to specialize in Greek philosophy. So that the individual, one of the individuals who is one of the most famous members of Miletus was Thaleo, Thaleo of Miletus. He is the father of science. Because he's the first one that began to what? To develop the scientific method. As we really, you know, at the beginning of the intellectual approach to reality. Now when did Thaleo live? If you'll notice, Thaleo lived also around 580 BCE, which is the exact same time as the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed. So we see that the Kedusha, which was invested in Kalisol, which was lost, went into Yovan, and they began to take that. That's why I say very interesting fact that the Shina, which is what, is the source of the Kedusha, the Odin first. Part of it went into Bovel, an aspect of it went to Bovel, which gave it the, the ability to destroy the, second base, the first Beit HaMikdash, and the rest of it went to Miletus. In a certain sense, the Shina was exiled to little Miletus on Asia Minor. It's really funny. Now, when I mean the Shina, I don't mean the Shina itself and such, but an aspect of the power of the Shina was born in Miletus. And that's the first that the Goyim, Jovan, the Greeks took from the Jews and became the foundation of all intellectual pursuits for the next 2,500 years. There are many modern day historians who say that all of modern history started in ancient Greece. They began and they ended it, you see. And in a certain way, it's, true, it's totally true. Because in the period of about 500 BCE, you see, until uh, the turn of the, the common era, the Greeks ruled the world with their wisdom. And then for the next 1300 years until the Renaissance, it was totally dark. 
And all the people who lived in the Dark Ages, you see, in the 7th, 8th, 9th century, and the ones who lived in the medieval times, in the 11th, 12th, 13th century, all focused on the Greeks. The church, which became the main power at that time, in the medieval times, began to what? Translate the words of Plato and Aristotle and Socrates and so on, you see. And the study of Greek philosophy became the greatest pursuit, you see. For 1300 years, 1400 years after the Greeks were in decline, so you see the enormous power that the Greeks had held sway. I mean, Aristotle was known as the king of all Chachamim. You see, it was only until what the Renaissance that they began to actually argue with Aristotle. But in terms of Aristotle, was the greatest Chachamim of all, and the truth is, he probably was, as far as the the Goyim are concerned. But that's what it was. But where did they take that light? That light is from the first place of Mendes. Now, if you look at the second base of Megiddo, we also look at the same thing. When the second base of Megiddo is destroyed, the Kedusha was lost by Christ as well and given over to the Aesop, to the Goyim. Now, who got the O's? Who got the ability for, to dominate the world with power? Rome. You see, Rome. But where did it first go? Where did the Chachma go? Where did the light of truth go? It didn't go to Rome. Where did it go? What was happening about the time that the base of Megiddo was destroyed, which is in 70? What was happening during that time? Do we see an upsurge in some kind of light? And the answer is we do, and a very strange thing. What did Kalis or what did the Jews lose at the time of Rabbi Kiva? Actually, before then, what did they lose at the time of the destruction of the Second Temple in the time of Rabbi Kiva? They lost the light of the Mashiach. Well, that light of the Mashiach then left Kalis and it went into the light of the Goyim, into the hands of the Goyim. So that the Goyim suddenly found themselves with the light of the Mashiach. Now what does the light of the Mashiach look like in the hands of the Goyim? What does it look like? Well, I'll tell you what it looks like. It looks like the following. Christianity. What is Christianity? Christianity is the belief in the Mashiach. It is a belief in God, you see. It is a belief in a Mashiach. It is a belief, okay, it is a belief in the Trinity. But essentially what Christianity is, it is a belief in the heaven and the hell, in an Olam Haba, that there will come a Mashiach who will redeem the world and bring goodness to the world. But these are all Jewish concepts. In the time of the Holy by Christian, all there was were the Romans, and the Romans were what? Polytheistic. They believed in idols, right? There was no nation in the world that had a real concept of heaven and hell in a real way, where there's a Kedusha to it, and that a person is judged by good and bad deeds and that they will come and redeem to, uh, redeem it to the world. You see, these were unknown to the Goyim. The Goyim were essentially what? Avodah Zorah. They were idolatrous. Suddenly we find at the same period of time, Goyim coming up and beginning to believe in concepts which are like Jewish concepts. More than that, Christianity is based on the belief that the Goyim took over the Jewish religion. That God discarded the Jews because of their sins and chose the Goyim. You see, Jesus has come to replace the Torah. And that's what he says. You see, what Jesus says is, I have come to replace the law by believing in me, by believing in who I am and what I will do. You have what? Have essentially been able, you have to acquire the method to be kind or to acquire Olam Haba. Belief in me is your salvation and I have come to replace all the commandments. When you believe in me, you don't have to do any commandments because I am the Torah. And that's why the Goyim called themselves the sons of Israel, B'nai Israel. The Christians told that they are the true Jews, or the two sons of Israel, so that even recently when they had that dialogue between the Jews who want to see the Pope, that the Dastus meeting between the Jews and the Pope, you see, essentially the Cardinal said very simply, he says, we don't, we, he said to the Jews, he says, fundamentally, we Christians believe that Judaism finds its ultimate perfection in Christianity. That's the essence of Christianity. Christianity is not a religion that says you Jews are false and your religion is false. It doesn't say that. Like, what Christianity says is that you Jews are 100% right. But you are right in your time. We have taken over. And God has chosen us as His chosen people. Because you have defaulted. That's the belief of the Christians. That's why, therefore they, that's why they believe that the New Testament, that they call the New Testament, has taken over what they call the Old Testament, which is the Torah. And I believe in Jesus is a substitute or a replacement for what? For the observance of the Tariq Mitzvah. And that's essentially what it is. But if you really look at it, what is Christianity? Christianity, Christianity is Judaism in the Klippus. It's Judaism with a tzaddik is the sultan. Mm-hmm. 
The rep is the Sutton. That's what it is. The rep is the Sutton. And when the Sutton is a Rebbe in front of a table, that religion is called Christianity. But that's why it has many, many, it has many features which are similar to Judaism. But it's a complete distortion of Judaism because what it essentially does is first of all make Jesus into a son of God, you see, and Goyim cannot get away from the idea that God is beyond man. That's the most important thing with Goyim. Somehow man is God. They can't get beyond that notion that you see, that you can be a God. They can't get beyond it. So they're forever trying to make some man into a God. Whether it's Greek mythology or Roman mythology or Hercules or Jupiter or whoever it is. There's always some man up there that's always cracking that he's a god. <laughs> and the Christians came along with the same Kurdish, the same idea, but that idea is that Jesus is a god, you see. He's the son of a god. They're a little more humble. <laughs> but that's essentially what it is. But the notion here is this concept that the Christians have taken over the idea of mitzvahs of good and evil of heaven and hell, of all of Haba and all of Hazar, of the Mashiach, of the concept of the Jews, and the concept of what? Many of these things. Like if you listen, if you hear sometimes Sermon on the Mount, which is a famous sermon by Jesus, it's almost a common copy in some way of what Hillel said. He said that Hillel was smarter, because what Jesus says in Sermon on the Mount is, uh, if your enemy comes over, and smacks you on one cheek, turns the other side, which is a total distortion of what the situation is. With what Judaism simply says is what is detestful to you, do not do unto your cover. It's the whole thing. In other words, you should not do to someone else what you find despicable. But it doesn't mean that you have to lie yourself be victimized by a complete Russia. <laughs> and that's an expression of love. <laughs> you see. But these are some of the concepts. And, uh, The light which is Christianity is the Jewish light that was lost at that point in time. It is not a coincidence that Christianity started just when the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed and Rabbi Kiva was what and his generation was defaulting. That is no accident. Because the loss, the failure of Rabbi Kiva and Kokhba to bring the Messianic period and the fate of Christ to take the Messianic light at that time instilled the power and the spirit into Christianity and they took it instead. You see. And they made a messianic religion. So they had a Mashiach. They want a Mashiach still alive. He was his name wasn't Rabbi Kiva, his name was Jesus. But he was a false Mashiach, you see. He was a false Mashiach and he was a Christian Mashiach. It's a Mashiach turned upside down on his head. It's a Mashiach who says you don't have to listen to the Torah anymore. It's a Mashiach who says that I'm part of being God. It's a twisted Mashiach, you see but it's still a Mashiach. That's why Christianity has, Christianity has in it many roots of truth in it, ringed by tremendous what? Tremendous uh, outside covers of, of falsity and of shekha, of darkness. It's inner light. There's an inner light in Christianity which is true, you see. Because part of that light comes from our light, from the Jewish light. But since it's so imbued through and through with tremendous shekha, it's totally false in its essential presentation. Later on, when we go finish some of the issue, we will go more deeply into some of the theology of Christianity to understand what some of the key ideas that they say are mamish borrowed from Judaism and how they distort it as a result. But that we would have to save till later on. But again, here we have it. What we see is that when the Jews fail to bring the Messianic time, that Kedusha goes into the hands of the Sultan. And from the Sultan it goes into the Nishamas or the Fashas that he controls. And those are the Nishamas of the Goyim. Because that's his essential arrangement or contract with Asaph. We will see a similar type of scenario in modern history. And that's what we're going to be discussing right now. What was happening in the 16th and 17th century? Something was happening in the 16th and 17th, 16th and 17th century, mainly the 16th century when it started, which was extraordinary that never happened before. An enormous, enormous thing. What really is the light of the Mashiach? 
one of the things in the light of Mashiach. The light of the Mashiach is called the Pneumisa Torah, or the inner light of the Torah itself. Next time we will go into that in much more detail. But what that light allows one to do is to understand what are the main principles which have determined the course of human history and to understand what determines human events. It also allows us to understand what the Hashgoch is, how God runs the world, what the providence is, where he's leading the towards. And what are the basic criteria which he uses to judge the world when he applies justice, when he applies mercy in every specific individual incident in everyone's life? And how all people are interconnected and all nations are interconnected. That's what this light is called, the Pneumius Torah, or the inner light of the Torah. That light has never been revealed, but it was given to Moshe Rabbeinu. When the Bodhisattva gave him the entire Torah, it was also given to him. But when he passed it down, he didn't pass it down to everyone. He only gave it to a certain select number of individuals who were able to learn from that and see a great thing. But Moshe Benu did not possess that light in its fullest perfection. He did not. And was explained last time because he failed to become the Mashiach himself, or at least the Mashiach that would bring, bring the ultimate redemption. So what happened was, that light that he did possess, he passed down and that was passed down further into generation to generation only by a certain number of Jews. A great many Jews were not involved in that aspect of the Torah. And that aspect of the Torah is called the soul, or the mystery, or in Aramaic it's called the word. Soul means secret or mystery, or word means secret or mystery. The nature of this information was passed down from generation to generation only in exclusive circles. And the only Jews who were entitled to listen to this information were those who were on a very high madrig in Yerushimayim. It was never written down, really. Now there were certain instances when it finally was written down. And it was written down in some examples by certain key individuals. But even though they wrote down some of the principles, it was really not understood at all. Because the information was written in the form of metaphors. Now what is a metaphor? A metaphor is essentially some kind of symbol which you use to represent an actual idea. You see. So that if I want to, for example, talk about the power of God, if I want to talk about the power of God itself, I can use the symbol of light to represent that power. That's a metaphor. Or, which means light. It refers to the physical energy of light, the electromagnetic energy of light. We use that word, or, to symbolize the power of the Bernishon. So we say when the Bernishon creates something, he projects forth a light. And he doesn't project forth a light. The Bernishon is not a big bulb. Right? But what it is, is, we use it, since we cannot come to real understanding of what that power is, we have to use metaphors or symbols. Now the problem with understanding the Pneumisa Torah is that the Pneumisa Torah talks about the ultimate laws of existence itself and the ultimate laws of consciousness. It talks about things and processes which are beyond our ability to really grasp. Because these processes are beyond sensation. They're beyond the five senses. So we therefore cannot in any sense really sense these things. When the Pneumisa Torah talks about how God does things in the world, it talks about the various different aspects of His power and the different configurations in which that power becomes manifest and how that power configuration then comes down and interfaces with the objects of the world, you see. But the actual prophecies refer to spiritual events and spiritual structures and entities which are beyond the mind to understand in terms of the mind to understand because of its abstractability and it's beyond the senses to perceive. So therefore, how are we to talk about this type of information? The truth is we can't. We have to use metaphors. Now what happened was, there were many great men in Jewish history who understood these processes. You see. But when they wanted to reveal it, they didn't want to reveal the actual processes. What they did was reveal it in terms of metaphors and they hid the information in terms of all kinds of symbols. And what they did was they wrote their books in, in terms of many, many different symbols. But they didn't tell you really what the ideas were that they were talking about. 
A metaphor in Hebrew is said to be a mushal. Okay? A mushal is a metaphor. It is a symbol. That which the symbol refers to, or the idea that refers to, is called a nimshal. A nimshal. All those men who sought to write down the information always wrote in Mashalom, in metaphors, never in Nimshalom. They would never tell you what they really were talking about. First of all, in certain cases they had to use Mashalom, you see, because you have to use certain symbols to deal with certain what? Spiritual ideas, you see. But even in that case, they would never tell you what the ideas were they were referring to, you see. They wouldn't reveal it to you. So that if you would read one of their books, you would think it's a very strange story, almost like a fairy tale. You see, the Gemara is known for this process. The Gemara is composed of several different sections. But one of the main parts that it has, of course, the Gemara is concerned with the halacha. It wants to define what is the halacha, or what is the Jew supposed to do in terms of observing the 630 commandments. So all of the Talmud, a great deal of the Talmud is concerned with explaining or discussing the halacha. But there's a large section of the Talmud which relates not with the halakha, but rather with what's called the Agada, or things that have to do with Jewish philosophy, or the Pneumus of Torah. But the Gemara would not openly tell you what these things were, so it would tell you very, very strange stories. It would tell you the story about a person, for example, who went to a certain, there's some very strange stories about people who encountered talking fish, or trees, or whatever the story is. Bizarre things that obviously seem to look like fairy tales. But those stories that it tells about really contain, they are Mishalom, that really contain very, very deep ideas. But the key, the Mafteach, or the key to go or to bridge the gap between the Mashal and the Nimshal was not given over to the Jews, only to a select number of individuals. <coughs> That's why most, a great deal of the Talmud is not understood. Really. And when Rabbi Moshe Chaim Mutzaro says very clearly, in, his, in a certain essay that he wrote, Maimal Agoda, which is the essay on the Agoda and Talmud, he says it very clearly about this. And I will give you one example of where you see this in the Gemara. There's a very famous Gemara in Psachim, and there was a very great controversy between the sages of Israel, the Chachamim, and the sages of Greece. And the argument was, who revolves around who? Does the earth revolve around the sun? Or does the sun revolve around the earth? You see. The sages of Israel said that what? That the sun revolves around the earth. I'm sorry. The sages of Israel said reverse. That the, uh, I'm sorry. They said that the sun revolves around the earth. And the Greeks said that the earth revolves around the sun. Okay? Now, which one is essentially correct? The Greeks because obviously it's the earth which revolves around the sun. Ever since Copernicus, we all know that it's the earth which revolves around the sun in a solar system. You see, there are nine planets which all revolve around the sun. The sun doesn't revolve around us. So, it would seem that the discussion between the Greeks and the sages of Israel was an astronomical discussion. You see. But that's not what it was at all. And La Moshe Chaim says that very carefully. It has nothing to do with astronomy, because astronomically it's the earth that goes around the sun. What the argument was, really, between the Greeks and the Jews at that time, was what's called, not astronomically, but more closer to astrologically, or what's called Mysebracious. What is Mysebracious? If you look at the world in terms of the science of the world, physics, chemistry, biology, you'll see the laws of how, what, the world works. They call the laws of nature. When we look at physics, we see the laws of matter and energy. How matter turns into energy and so on, and energy into matter and so on. The laws of light, nuclear fission, and so on, and sound energy or mechanical energy, and all these things. And chemistry, how different elements come together to form compounds and all kinds of substances. Biology, the laws of the human body, and so on. These are the laws of science. But the interesting question is, what moves the laws of science? What makes the laws of science to be what they are? Obviously, spiritual powers and spiritual forces. So that behind all the what? All the physical laws of science, there are spiritual powers which submit to their own laws. The argument between the Greeks and between the sages of Israel was on that level of where that spiritual power lay. 
Does it lay with the sun or would it lay with the earth? You see, where were the central Rukhti Tzikhoichas that determined the design of the world? Where were they located? You see, and that was really the argument between the sages of Israel and between the Greeks. So therefore what we see is that on the surface, the machrokas or the controversy between the two would simply be what? Would seem to revolve around some kind of what? Some kind of physical discussion or astronomical discussion. The truth is, the physical discussion or the astronomical discussion was really a muscle or metaphor for the spiritual processes underneath, what's called my separation. My separation means the what? The act of creating the world. It is the law, the understanding of how God created the physical world from the spiritual. It's the linkage between the world of the spiritual and the world of the physical. The knowledge that talks about how the physical came from the spiritual is called my separation. You know what separation means in the beginning God created them in the world. My separation means the act of creation. That's what my separation means. My separation is the understanding of how the physical came from the spiritual. Science is simply the understanding of the laws of the physical world. But science does not reveal how it's connected to the spiritual world. My sabratius is the chokhma or the wisdom that does that. Now there's another wisdom which is called my samakava. My samakava means the act of the Merkava, the Merkava means the chariot. Merkava means a chariot. And it refers to the vision of Yechezkel that he had, that he, when he first looked up, he saw this chariot come down from the heavens. And that the wheels and the chairs were composed of malachim and angels. And that the one who was riding it had the face of a man and the face of an eagle. It was like a very symbolic thing that he saw in prophecy. <laughs> And it's considered one of the deepest of all prophecies in the Torah. It's called the Maitre Makava. It's right at the beginning of Yechezko, or Ezekiel. And it shows his vision. It's called the vision of the chariot. That vision is the vision of how the entire spiritual world is constructed by itself. Divorced from the physical. It is the laws of the spiritual world. It is the laws of the Hashgacha. Or the laws of the Ruchnistika world itself. That's called Maitre Makava. Maitre Makava is the study of the principles of the spiritual world. My Sabratius is the study of how the spiritual world produces the physical. Now, the entire Gemara, all over, discusses both of these things. But when it discusses these things, it always uses mashalam. It always uses metaphor or symbol. Never revealing what the nimshal is, what the idea that it's really discussing. That's true of the Gemara, and that's true of later books that were written. For example, there were certain books that were written later on. The most famous, of course, was the Zohar by Rabbi Shimon ben Yechoi, who was a student of Rabbi Kiva. The Zohar, essentially, was a mystical interpretation of the Torah, the Hamisha Chomshi Torah, the five books. And it's simply a running commentary on all five books. But it's a commentary, a peerish on the Torah, according to the soul according to the panemius, or the inner light. So that it describes both Maitre Makava and Maitre Gracious in terms of Mashalom. Anybody who reads it finds it very difficult to understand. There are sections of the Zohar which are totally mysterious. For example, there's one famous section of the Zohar which talks about what's called the Adon Kadmon, or the, the, earth, the primordial man. And it talks to it, and I'll show you an example of what I mean. You'll get a first class example of what I'm talking about. There's one famous part in the Zohar, a very famous part, which talks about what's called the primordial man. The primordial man is a giant man-like figure who has a beard and a skull and a nose and eyes and so on, and a complete body. And then what the Zohar begins to do is to discuss how many hairs there are on the beard, what the beard looks like, the different aspects of the eyes, the hair, the ears, the nose, the mouth, and then the, the height and the width of the chest and so on. And this is the whole discussion in that section. Bizarre, isn't it? Strange. But that entire discussion of what's called the Odom Kadmon, which is a discussion of some kind of the anatomy of a person, of a man, is really a muscle or a symbol for the highest levels of spirituality. It's the discussion of the various different levels of spiritual realms 
one coming from the other even before we get to the physical it's really the discussion of all the different spiritual realms that are between our physical world and the ultimate world of Olam Haba and all the different worlds in between to get there and it's all symbolized by the discussion about the head and body of a man when you read it you see that this is what is it talking about but it's all martial so that people who read it have no idea of what it's talking about so that even though he wrote the Zohar Rabbi Shimon Ben Yechari it was very very difficult to understand and shortly thereafter it was hidden away it was locked up and it was hidden so that even that book was completely hidden but that was one of the first examples of a book that was written on the soul of the Torah on the, the community of the Torah or the inner light of the Torah <laughs> but it was written as metaphor and then it was locked away and let me just explain one thing but who is Asaph today? Asaph today is Rome but Rome doesn't exist anymore Asaph today is what Rome became and Rome became Christian with Constantine Christianized the entire Roman Empire that's why it became the Holy Roman Empire you see so that all of Rome and the power of Rome was transferred to the Christians and that's why where did the Pope live in Rome and the language of the Pope or Christianity is Latin you see Rome or Christianity today means all Christians it are the spiritual heirs of Asaph and this is English because we mentioned is that Christmas, which appears in which occurs in December, is an erroneous holiday because the birth of Jesus was in, in April or May. It was in the springtime, and the reason why the Christian holiday was made in December is because of a Roman holiday that used to occur from December 26th, I believe, until the New Year's Day, which was a very big feast of the Roman period of time. So what the early Christians did was to correspond, to coincide that rather their their holiday with the Roman holiday. Now why did the Romans holiday? Why did the Romans make a holiday? At the end of December? That's another thing. Because that's interesting. Just like the Egyptians knew that their power came from the sun, from the month of April, or the Ram. The Egyptian, the main Egyptian god is, is Amun-Ra, the sun god. And Amun-Ra, the symbol of Amun-Ra is a ram. If you look at the, the Egyptian temples, it's the head of it's a, man, a body of a man, a man and the head of a ram, because they worship the zodiacal sign of, Air, of Aries. Now Aries takes place on Hanukkah and on Pesach, Pesach, so that the Jews captured the power of Egypt by capturing their month. That's what the Bonitim says. When the Bonitim says this month is your first month, Nisan. Nisan is Aries, is the month of Aries. But Nisan used to be the main month of the Egyptians. It's a lot of people don't know that. Nisan was the spiritual month of the Egyptians. And when the Jews went out of Egypt and they conquered Egypt, they took back the Kedusha. So what happened was Nisan became their month instead of the Egyptians. Now the Romans celebrated their month, their main month was the month of Tevez in Hebrew which corresponds to Capricorn in the zodiac of time you see now Capricorn is symbolized by a goat Capricorn is a goat okay now in Hebrew a goat is a sohir that's how you say goat in Hebrew now another name for Esau is Seir Harseir is the mountain of Esau Esau lived on Mount Harseir so the goat is a symbol of the power of Esau you see, it's a symbol. And that power of Aesop is in the month of Capricorn. That's where the Romans knew that in some way the Abu the Zohar was connected to Tebes, which happens at the end of December. Mm. You see that? The, the goat, now, besides that, the goat is also the symbol of the sun. What it says in Chazal, Chazal says that the most powerful month you are two months in the year which the sun is able to suddenly arise with much stronger power than others and accuse the Jews. One is the month of Tebe, which is Capricorn, and the other is the month of Ov. The Beit HaMidish was destroyed in Ov, <coughs> Sishabov, right? But what, we, what happens in the month of Tebe? Asura Tebe is the fast of Tebe. 
Because on the 10th day of Tevez, which is the month of Capricorn, is when the Romans first broke into Yerushalayim. And that was the beginning of the end. In certain ways, Asur Tevez was more ominous than Tisha B'Av itself. Because once the Romans, or rather, had Romans, had the power, the Kedush of the Jews, in the month of Tevez, that was it. Tisha B'Av was almost a foregone conclusion. But Tevez is the main month, and it's the worst month of the Jews. Because it's the highest month of Esau. Again, because it represents the zodiacal science of the goat, which is Haseya, which is Esau itself. Now the Christians, you see, who are the spiritual, what, heirs of the Romans, celebrate the beginning of their holiday in the month of Pele, which is Seya. So if anyone wants to have a proof in certain ways that the Christians are Romans in different clothing, Christmas is the main proof of that, one of them, besides all the other things. But their very holiday, the biggest symbol of theirs, is Tevez, is Hase, is, is the Seir, is Hase, is the Soya, which is Capricorn. Although the Christians themselves don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's go back to what we said before. So therefore, the Pneus of Torah was always in the form of Mishalom, whether it's in the Gemara or in the Zohar, which was written by Rav Shem Ben Yechoi, which as I've said, is a mystical interpretation of the Torah. Now, the mystical interpretation of Torah is also referred to as the Kabbalah. Why is it referred to as the Kabbalah, the famous, the holy Kabbalah? The word Kabbalah comes from the word Kibel, to receive. And the essence of Kabbalah simply means is that the mystery part of the Torah, or the Pneumus of the Torah, was received from Moshe Rabbeinu, just like the Halachas, or the Tariq Mitzvahs. And that's a very, very important thing. Why is Jewish mysticism called reception? what it's called, reception. Why is it called something like soul or something else? Why is it called Kabbalah? Because the fact is, and this is what Judaism maintains, everything comes from Moshe Mishinai. Whereas the Greeks and all the philosophers sat down and tried to understand what the world was about through logic and through influence. What the Jews maintain is that all our wisdom is in the Torah and the entire Torah from every level, whether it's the literal meaning, the simple meaning, you see, or the mystical meaning, it all comes back the Kabbalah, by tradition, by reception from Moshe Rabbeinu. So that the source of all Jewish wisdom is God himself. That's the essence. Not only is the Torah from the Baruch Hashem, but even the mystical or the pneumious of it is also from the Baruch Hashem. So that no man can claim that he was set up and concocted all this thing, and it's, not, it's, it's, it's not, all these ideas, and these ideas are simply another Jewish philosophy. You know, Socrates said something, Plato said something, Aristotle said something, you know, all of the, each different, Aristotle, all of these different prophets said something, and the Jews said something else. Jewish, the Kabbalah is not Jewish philosophy, because the philosophy by definition comes from the word, philo, philosophy comes from the word philos, means to love, philo, P, uh, philo means to love, like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, or philanderer, who is a, a lover, and sofa, sofa means wisdom. You see, philosophy means the love of wisdom. But it means to understand wisdom through intellect, by reasoning and by logic. And Torah is not known in its origin through logic. You apply logic to understand it, but the truth of Torah comes from the Mitzinai, from the Bonnet That's why even the Jewish mysticism is called Kabbalah. And it's no different than the Mishnayat, or the Torah itself. It's a, simply another part of Torah Shavah Peret, the old law. Now, the, all these books, all this information about Jewish mysticism, or the Pneumus of Torah, I don't like to call it Jewish mysticism, because that word is bandied about by a lot of people who call it, you know, I, I don't like to refer to it in that way. We we'll refer to it as the Kabbalah, but I don't even like to talk about Kabbalah, because Kabbalah also has a bad connotation, it, unfortunately. We will talk about it as the Seda Torah or the Pneumus Torah, the inner light of the Torah, because it refers to the understanding of the spiritual realm, and how the spiritual realm, what, the Maitim Makabah, which are the laws of the spiritual realm, and the Maitim Bracious, which are laws of how the spiritual bridge the gap to the physical. Remember, Maitim Bracious and Maitim Makabah are the two segments of Jewish mysticism, which was received by Moshe Beno, on Hashinai from God. That's the construction. And this is called the Pneumus Torah. 
Now finally, that information was hidden for a long, long time, for over a thousand years, until about the 13th century, until about in the 1200s. It was found again, you see. And there's a whole story of how it was found. Arya Kaplan, in his book, Meditation and the Kabbalah, has a fascinating account of how the Zohar was, re- was uh, found again, you see. And it was found by certain individuals, and the one who made it, who seemed to have publicized it, was Moshe Shem Tov de Leon. I mean, the Moshe Shem Tov de Leon, who lived in the 1200s, and it was a great Kabbalist. And many people thought that he wrote it. But he didn't write it. Essentially, he found the manuscript, or it was given to him in some way, the manuscript of Abshim Ben Yechoi, and he simply published it again. And, and as soon as it came out, it was instantly accepted by all the Jewish Chachamim. Because somehow they all knew that this was the Jewish heritage from Rav Shimon Yechoi on the soul of the Torah. But even though it was learnt in the 13th and 14th century, it was very difficult to understand. But for the first time, the book on Jewish what? Maitre Makova and Maitre Gracious suddenly became a popular textbook. But nobody knew what it was talking about, really. You see. It's almost like the light was beginning to be publicized or beginning to be revealed. But it was not yet time. You see, so that was revealed completely in Mishalom. And no one really understood that. The Torah is therefore called the Torah of Nista. Nista means the hidden Torah. Versus the Gemara and the Mishnah, which is called Nigla, or the revealed Torah. So the Torah of Nista, which is the Kabbalah, or the Pleas of the Torah, suddenly became widely sought after and available, but yet no one really understood it. No one really understood it. Until the 1500s, when a man was born who was an extraordinary, extraordinary individual. And we have to understand certain things about him, you see. I mean, he was an extraordinary person by any dimension. And his name was Rabbeinu Yitzchak Luria. His name was Rabbi Yitzchak Luria, or Rabbi Isaac Luria, also called the Ari. Now, Ari, it means in Hebrew, a lion. <coughs> but what it really stands for, it's an acrostic that stands for the beginning letters of Elo, Eloki, Rabbi Yitzchak, the godly Rabbi Yitzchak. Now, no one has ever received that kind of title with the word Eloki in front of it, the godly. You've never seen it, you see. Sometimes the Tanoim, since the Tanoim, they say, Hatana for Eloki. You know, the godly Tana, to show you the stature. Rabbi Shem if you look at the beginning of the Zohar, it says, Hatana for Eloki. Eloki being the adjective means, like almost a godly, a, a man of God. They are at the highest of all titles. But you'll very, never really see before a man's name, Eloki Rabbi Yisra. You see, the Ari was such a man. And what I'd like to do is discuss some things about the Ari to understand what kind of a person this was. And what he did. He was an extraordinary man. He lived in Egypt most of his life, in some island in the Nile, and sat and learned the entire day. But when I say he sat and learned, he learned in a very strange way. He had a very strange chavusa. His chavusa was Elion Hanavi. And most of the time he was learning with Elion Hanavi. Most of the world had never heard of him or known him. Until finally, the last two years of his life, he picked himself up from Egypt and he came to Israel and he settled in the city of Sfas. And even then nobody knew of him. Now, in the city of Sfas, there were some real big people. Who? Rabbi Yosef Cairo. Rabbi Yosef Cairo, who wrote the Shulchan Aruch. Rabbi Shlomo al Kabbat, who wrote the Lechod Adi, the Kwaskel on Shabbat. You see? The Alchich, who wrote a very famous comment in the Torah. Rabbi Chaim Vital. Rabbi Moshe Kodavero, who was the greatest person in the world at that time, the greatest Kabbalist. The city of Sfat, that little city of Sfat, had more Kabbalists and mystics and Sadiqim per square inch than any other place on earth. It was a city which was loaded with Kedusha and Torah, but not the Kedusha of an extraordinary stature, you see, extraordinary stature of the highest form. And into this town came this person, Rabbi Yitzchak. 
Ashkenazi or the Ari. We're talking about the years about 1540, 1550. That's when this was happening. Now the Ari was not really known well in the city because he was an unknown guy who was king from Egypt. I mean, they heard certain things. Obviously, he seemed to be a good tzaddik. Until one day, Rabbi Vital, who was one of the greatest Kabbalists of his time, Rabbi Chaim Vital, was, was talking to him on a certain occasion, and they were talking about a certain piece of the Zohar. And the Ari apparently, obviously, didn't reveal much about himself. And suddenly, he said to Rabbi Chaim Vital, he started to explain to him what was in the Zohar. And I don't know what piece of the Zohar that was, <laughs> what he said. But obviously, what the Ari did was say something to Rabbi Chaim Vital, and Rabbi Chaim Vital understood that no human mind could know what he just said. And, and Rabbi Chaim Vital, who was one of the greatest in the world, he said himself, because he wrote the book on the Ari, a biography on the Ari, called the Shifcha Ari, or the, the, uh, the uh, praises of the Ari. And he wrote, he, we know about the Ari from Rabbi Chaim Vital, who became his biggest student. And he said, but, he said, look, I was one of the biggest guys in the world in Kabbalah. What am I doing with him? He was, about, he was about as old as the Ari. He said, what am I doing with him? He said, the Ari at this time, excuse me, was 36 years old. And he said, to me, who was the Ari? I was one of the greatest guys in the world. I wouldn't go to him to learn. But one day I was sitting and learning and I saw that this man's knowledge was beyond the ken of the earth. It was superhuman. And what he says is, and I got down on my knees and I begged him to become my teacher. Because he realized, and then the Ari said to him, that the only reason why he came to Sfat was to teach you behind the towel. Because everything he knew, he was not allowed to write down. The Barisham, they offered him, they prohibited him in the Shemayim to write down what he knew. And his purpose was to come to teach this of Chaim Vital because Rabbi Chaim Vital could write down what he knew. You see. And he learned with Rabbi Chaim Vital for only two years. And then two years later, the Ari said to Rabbi Chaim Vital, you have to be Mespalo for the Mashiach Ben Yosef because he's in danger. And Rabbi Chaim Vital did not understand this and shortly later, the Ari died. And he realized that the Ari was the Mashiach Ben Yosef in his time. You see. Now who was the Ari? Well, let's see what Rav Chaim Vital says, who the Ari was. The Ari was a person, you see, who, he could look at you. He could look at your forehead, you see, and the body. He can tell you every reincarnation that your Neshama had, and where it was connected to the other Mauritian before the sin. The Ari can simply smell your odor from your body, and he can tell you all the chatoim and sins you did. The Ari can simply look at you, and he would tell you one minute in advance what you would think about one minute later. There was nothing in heaven and earth that was not known. Besides that he knew the language of the birds and the flowers and everything. The Ari knew what was going on in the Shemayim. Every time there was a gazero against the Jews, the Ari knew about it. And he could simply look at you and tell you instantly everything that was going on in you and what you needed to do to correct your Neshama. And he was always accurate. It's an extraordinary thing. In fact, what the Rabbi Vital says that was that the Neshama of the came from what's called Kesa de Atsidus. That's the highest of all powers that have ever emanated from the Shina. And the Ari Neshama comes from that section. And to show you how big the Ari was, you heard of, I don't know if you heard of Rabbi Yosef Cairo, who is the author of the Shulchan Aruch and the greatest Halakha codifier. I mean, the last 400 years. Who doesn't know from Rabbi Yosef Cairo who wrote the whole Shulchan Aruch? The four, the four sections of the Shukhan that is the foundation of all our law today. <laughs> and Rabbi Yosef Cairo was much older than the Ariya, because he came from the Inquisition, from the Castillo, from Spain. And when he wrote, Rabbi Yosef Cairo wrote down and he said, he wrote a letter to the Ari, and in the letter of the Ari, he asked him a certain question. He wanted to know a certain question, or a rather a certain question. And what he did was he writes incredible things in the Ari, like who the Ari was, and he asked the Ari if he can learn Kabbalah on the level of the Ari. And the Ari says, no, you cannot. Because your Neshama is tied only to know up to a level of Halacha. But the levels of Kabbalah is beyond your ability. Can you imagine that? This is the Yates of Cairo. Who is Yates of Cairo? Yates of Cairo wrote another book called Magid Meshon. And in that book, he describes his discussions with a Malach that he used to learn with. But the Yates of Cairo had what's called a Magid. A maggot is a malach who comes down to learn with you, if you're on that level. So Yosef Cairo had a standard chavutza with a malach. <laughs> and with that level, the Ari said to him, you cannot go further, up to a point, you see. And who can go further? Only men like the Ari and other, certain other people, in that sense. But the Ari, every night, 
I mean, whatever, he used to put his head down and his neshama used to go up to the Yishim Shemala and then when he came down, he would awake and he would remember everything that was learned. You see? That's the kind of individual that we're dealing with. I mean, astounding. I mean, literally astounding. Now you understand why they call him Eloki. He was such a stature that there was not one Jew in the entire world who would dispute Yahweh. Normally when a Jew comes up with some new ideas or whatever stories, by the way, there's a lot of resistance, right? I mean, why was it? Machlekes. There was never any machlekes with Yahweh. Because to stand in front of him and to hear him talk or to see his clear, who's going to argue with this man? Who's going to say that you're not legitimate? Who? The man can look at you and tell you your entire past. And every, all the events you did, and he can tell you pieces of your future, where you came from, every Google you have, what happened to you, Don. Just by looking at you, and it's right, looking right through you. Who's going to argue with a man like this? And this is who he was. The man was more malach than Adam. And of course, ultimately, who is Yari? Well, Yari would says, what he says, what do you call it, in the, uh, uh, in the Chidah, the, uh, friend of the written on by me, he writes that the Yari, was a meter or a spark of the Nisham of Moshe Rabbeinu. And it's obviously that's what you're dealing with here. You see. But this man was given enormous information. But Moshe Chaim was Tato, who died only at 40, and was also an astounding person, a Kabbalist, and we'll get to him shortly, once wrote that I, in my entire life, I think, he wrote that I have been Zohar, or worthy to know, only 50% of what the Ari know. You see. And you talk about an extraordinary person who knew Kol Hatol Kula of Moshe Chaim Sparrow. And when he knew it was only 50%, you see. But I wouldn't feel too sorry about Ram Khal, because he also lived with Eli on, on, on a regular basis, starting from 18 years old, you see. So, that's the thing. But he was an extraordinary man. And what happened was, he was told information of the Moshe that had never come down to the world. And no one ever knew. So he explained the Zohar in ways that had never been known. And that's why his understanding of the Zohar is called the Kabbalah Ari, or the tradition of the Ari. And where did he get his information from? And if you look from this form, there were 16 volumes called the Kisve Ari, or the writings of the Ari that were written by Rabbi Chaim Vital, who learned this from the Ari in only two years. And it says over there that these writings are from Chaim Vital based on what he learned from Rabbeinu Yitzchak Loya, based on what he learned from Elio Hanavi. That's what it says exactly. It says, Mipi Elio. Clearly, where the Kisiyari comes. That's why nobody has ever disputed this. Whether you're the Vilnagon, the biggest Litvak, or you're the biggest Chos of the Baal Shem Tov, or you're the biggest Sfadi, whatever the story is, the Ari was sacrosanct. Nobody would defy the Ari. There has never appeared a man on the face of the earth like Yari since the days of Rabbi Akiva. You see, that's how big he was. He was a throwback. You see, for 1500 years a man has not walked the face of the earth like that, like Yari. Like you see, and he revealed an enormous amount. And for the first time, his student of Haim Tal wrote down in 16 volumes this information that was enormous information. And finally, the Pnimi Torah came down not in simply the Zohar, which is much smaller, but in the numerous amount of what? Of information. And there were students from him and so on. Now what was the problem? The problem was that even his writings was largely Moshal. It was much more than Rabshim and Yechoi had written. It was a tremendous commentary on the Zohar. And it opened up all kinds of information about Gilgulam. He had books from on Gilgulam, reincarnations, the laws of reincarnation. And all different parts of the spiritual world that had never been revealed to us. You go there as you saw today, right? You will go and walk there and you will walk and you will see different graves, right? They will say, here is buried what? Sinichas ben Yor, here is Hillel and Shammai, here is Shammai of Thailand, you ever go there to throw? They point out the graves. How do they know who is buried in these places? The other one, they didn't know. There was no grave marks. There was no stone that said, here is buried, what do you call it? Rabbi Yochanan Samzal, Rabbi Shem Ben Yechoi. I mean, he was known in Meron, but there was no markings at all. So how do they know that? The Ari. Because when he was in Tzfat, he would walk along and says, here lies, what do you call it? Pinchas uh, Ben Yoya. Here lies Shmuel. Here lies, he is the one who says who lies where. And that's how we know. That's why when you go on a tour of Israel and you go to different forums, you're basically, you're essentially what's following the Kabbalah of the Ari. That's how we know it. 